try and keep ahead of everybody, but you, you don't even want to know all the things that are happening, not only this week, but right now. Uh, so we think the TVL should be uploaded. The labs should be uploaded. Sorry, you didn't have them in time to print them out. There are printers in, in the lab. Uh, yeah, just try to make best we, we can. The uh, individual TBLs, if it initially said to hand them in on Friday, uh, they can be handed in on Monday, which actually works better anyway, because then you'll do the team, you know, like you'll do the team TBL. So this will give you extra time to read it and to kind of sit down and think about things and do these individual TBLs. Bring that to uh, class on Monday the complete TBL routine, and you're good to go. Yeah. Correct. No. They're both scheduled for Friday, but correct me if I'm wrong, but we're going to do, you should have read the article for sure, and then you can hand in the individual one on Monday, but it would be good to at least have one book. That, that's what we said. I thought, oh, oh, that's right. We're going to do it. Oh, I got quiz mixed up with the TBL. Uh, right. Okay. So we'll still have, we'll still have the TBL on Friday. Sorry about that. Okay, so we still have the TBL on Friday, uh, but you know, try to fill out your individual one, but you don't actually have to have that in till Monday, and then do the do the team TBL. I mean, it just gives you can have your individual TBL on Friday if you like, but because of the short notice, we just want to give you a little bit of extra time, and then Monday is the quiz. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, right. So after the lab. The, the schedule should be correct. Don't listen to me. Yeah, really. Okay. Um, what I want to do today is to finish up refraction or sorry, reflection, and also do a little bit of MASW, and maybe uh, one or two case histories. We'll see how far we can go. The important thing uh, for the seismic reflection, so remember in, in reflection, well, so let's suppose we got some, we've got a layered earth that looks looks like this, and if we've got a source here and a receiver here, remember there was there was potentially first arrivals that could come. Maybe some it could come along here, or maybe some could come and, and be a, a refracted a, a arrival. So those were the first ar arrivals that came. But we could also have lots of other things that come in. You know, we could have stuff that you know bounces back down here or. Uh, you know, bounces in here, or it goes way down deep, and then comes back in. And the result of that is that okay. So there's a first arrival. Maybe that's this direct arrival, or maybe that's the refracted wave, right? But then there's uh, you know a whole bunch of other things that are coming in. And the question is, okay, what about these guys? Can we make some use of them or not? And the answer is yes, we can make use of them. We can actually generate images of the subsurface which can be, you know, such that the geolo uh, geology can be inferred directly from those images. The essential ingredient here, however, is to process the data into what's called the ideal seismic trace. And by what we mean by that is that if I think about this trace here, that these reflections are coming directly from each acoustic impedance change as it's going vertically down and then coming back. So the information I'm thinking about is stuff that it's going straight down and, and straight back. 
And that was the, that gave rise to this ideal seismogram, which I hope you went and used the app. And we also spent most of Friday talking about it. So we started off with the geologic section. And then because we know the velocity and the density of each of these layers, that gives us an acoustic impedance log. So this is still depth. Now, because I've got a change of acoustic impedance, I get a reflection coefficient. So that gives us these guys here. This is in depth. I have to convert that to time. Each layer has got a particular velocity, so that's going to tell me where in time that reflection is going to come in. The final seismic trace is this reflectivity function that I've got here convolved with my seismic wavelet. And that gives me then a trace that, that looks like this. What we're now going to do is to do a, a reflection seismic experiment in which we collect a whole bunch of um, shot gather, so we take a shot here and then have a whole bunch of, of, of receivers that are spread out like that. And at each receiver, we're going to measure reflections that come from all of these different layers. And what we're going to do is to take these and process them in such a way as we get these, you know, the true ideal seismograms. And then we're going to put those all onto you know, a single image, and we're going to get out something that we can, uh, we can understand. So the basic idea is, is here. So let's suppose we've got a truck, and then we've got a whole bunch of these receivers that are, are, are sitting out here. And if the truck is here and these are receivers, I'm going to get reflections that kind of look like this. And if the truck moves, then I'm going to get a different set of re reflections that are going to be uh, off of these various interfaces. And that truck progressively moves. And for each time that I shoot, I'm going to get a whole bunch of receivers and a whole bunch of records. And that's going to give me what's called a common shot gather. Think that's next. So that's going to look something like this. So there's a, a source sitting right here. This is offset. And at each point along here, every couple of meters, there's a, re a receiver that's recording the information that's coming in with as a function of time. So if you looked at each individual one, honestly, you, you, you just wouldn't be able to make any sense out of it all. It just kind of looks, you know, it kind of looks like squiggles, right? And so you, you can't really see very, very much. On the other hand, even when you put things like this together and have a whole bunch of receivers, you start to see, wow, well, wait a minute, there's there's some interesting stuff that's that, that's coming in here. Uh, first of all, here's my first arrival. So here's the direct arrival. Here's my refraction. That's what you did in the first part. And then there's something coming in along here uh, that's actually going to be the airway. And then there's stuff coming in here. That's the ground roll. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's happening here. And the question is, OK, can I actually make any good use of, of, of that at all? So what we're going to do is we're going to take these guys and we're going to reorder them into what's called a common midpoint gather. By that, if we thought about this particular point here being like a common midpoint, then if I've got a, re uh, a shot here and a receiver here, I've got information that's reflecting off and back. Okay, And then if I did the same here, it would also be reflecting there. And now if I just keep expanding these guys, bam, 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 you can see that I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got six records here that all have the same midpoint. So that's what our, our goal is, is going to be. It's going to take these individual shot records, and we've got a whole bunch of them, and extract 
this shot, this receiver, and this shot, this receiver, and collect them all so that we have a common midpoint for those particular uh, transmit receivers. Okay, so it's just a matter of reordering things. And in fact, if we go back here, so if we thought about this particular point here, then we can see that the truck here and the receiver there, that record would be good, we'll go for that. And here's another one, truck here, receiver here, that's good. So we just collect all these guys and we put them together into a gather and that's gonna be a common midpoint gather. So let's go, let's go ahead and do that. So here is, in fact, this actually comes from your, your, your TBL. So this is a number of shot gathers. And now we're going to take those and select gathers that are sort of common midpoints. So here's a common midpoint gather. Here's another one, another one, another one, duck, 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 duck. Now the thing that you'll notice about this is that there's this kind of arrival of energy that looks like that. So on all of these guys, it kind of looks like that. So what's going on there and, and what do we do? If we look at these common midpoint gathers, yeah, so we've got sources and receivers that have this, this common midpoint, you can see that each one of them, I mean it's traveling through this upper uh, region with a velocity v, but it's got a little bit longer distance to, to go, and therefore the travel time is going to be given, well we've got squares here, but the travel time squared is equal to x over v, that's this distance between the shot and receiver, squared, plus some t naught. So this is an equation that tells us what the travel time is going to be if we've got a separation of shot and receiver x for velocity v and some initial uh, time t naught, which is just going to be the two-way travel time from the surface back to this interface and back up when it's just directly perpendicular. Okay, so that t naught If this is V and this is the thickness H, then T naught is equal to 2H upon V. T naught is because we're always dealing with two way travel times. Okay, so what do we recognize about this? This tells us that as X increases, that the travel time for the arrival should increase. And it goes by this particular e equation. So this equation is actually a hyperbolic equation that relates t with x. So that's a hyperbolic equation. We're actually going to use that to try to find out how to represent these reflections that are, are, are coming in. And the idea is going to be that we're going to find the best set of parameters, in this case the T naught and the V, such that this yellow curve here, which is the, you know, the hyperbola, best matches the arrival time of that reflection. Okay, so I guess this is, I've, I've basically said all this, we've got Here's our hyperbola, here's our T naught, which is twice the layer thicknesses over, over the velocity. And those are the things that we want to find. So how are we going to do that? If we locked, looked at our, uh, our arrivals, here they're stacked up, well, they're in, in, a, in a line like this, and you can see that they follow a, a hyperbola. And we want to find out 
what the curvature of that hyperbola is or what the velocity is that is associated with this kind of a, uh, well, eventually we're going to call it move out, but the amount of extra time that it takes for the wave to arrive at distance d3 compared to over here. And in, in order to do that, we need to do some kind of analysis to try to find out, okay, what kind of a curve do I put through here so that when I actually would stack along this curve or look along this curve, I'd have the most amount of kind of coherent energy. So you can see that if I plotted line V3 here, it's up here, but that's not a very good line for representing the arrival times of these guys. Similarly, V1 is not a very good path for representing the arrival times, but V2 is a great path. So if V2 is a great path and this T0 is, is, you know, is a good number, then I can say, well, you know what I could do? I could use that velocity and this <coughs> extra travel time. So that's, that's called, a, what's called a move out. So if we looked at the travel time T naught here and drew a line, that's this guy, and then every additional amount of time that it takes before that trace arrives at a particular station compared to this T naught, we're going to call that a delta T, and that's effectively a move up. So the procedure is <coughs> as follows. I've got these reflections. I try to find this hyperbola that goes through here. And then what I'm going to do is to compute what that move out time is. And I'm going to take this particular trace and crank it up to here. And then I'm going to crank this one up to there, this one up to there, this one up to there. And the end result is that now I'm going to get a, a system of traces that actually look like this. Okay, so I've transferred a particular reflection that looks like this on my, uh, on, on my seismograms. And I'm adjusting each trace according to this velocity and this move out time. And then once I've done that, then the good thing to do is like, okay, they're all the same. I'm going to stack. Because you remember if you're stacking something uh, a signal with noise, if you have multiple stacks, if you have n of them, then you get a square root n reduction in the noise. So that is, is the procedure. Uh, okay, so let me just escape here and I'll show you what one of the apps are. Okay, so here's, here's, here's one of the apps that, that you're working with or that you will be working with. And here's the simplest case that we could possibly talk about. We've got a, a, a source and then we've got just a whole bunch of receivers and we just have one, uh, one reflection coming in. And as we go farther away, you can see how this curve goes down so that there's a move out there's extra time that's required for this reflection to reach this far, uh, far geophone. And what we're going to try to do is to find out what the velocity hyperbola is here that represents this. And then we're going to make this move out correction. And then we're going to stack things. And this is pretty easy on this guy, right? Because we can, we can see him. But very often your records look like that. So I'm not sure what kind of a trained eye you have in, in here, but there's actually a reflection event in here that will ultimately want to try to figure out where, where it is. So the idea here is that uh, back to come back to here if we've got 
this particular reflection event, but if we had decided, oh, here's the hyperbola that I'm going to stack along, okay, if I, if I do that, well, first of all, what I'm going to do is to take this uh, hyperbola and I'm going to make my NMO correction, in which case the NMO corrected data would look like this. And then if I stack along here, just like this, I end up with something that looks like that. So it's not a particularly uh, good representation. So if I chose a different hyperbola, and there's two things wrong with this one, the T naught is wrong. So the T naught should probably be up here where the energy is coming in. And also the curvature of this is, is wrong. So I could increase T naught. Or decrease it, sorry. <laughs> okay, so that's the first one. So now I, I think I might be okay here with the, with the T naught. But what I'd like to do is to make this line match up with this. Currently, I've got a velocity of 3,000 meters per second. So the question that I have for you is the following. If I change this velocity then this curve is going to change in curvature. If I make this velocity higher than 3,000, then what is going to happen to this curve? Is it going to go more steeply down, or is it going to go flatter? So what's going to happen, and why? It's going to be flatter. Correct. And why? Perfect. Yeah, so the, the, if the velocity of the layer is higher, then you know, just because you're offset a particular distance doesn't make much difference. But if the velocity, so we could try that, right? So we could make that velocity a little bit higher. Right, if I make it crank it way up. So now you can see at 4,500 meters per second, it's, it's, it's almost flat. So what I want to do is to reduce that velocity, increase the move out, and find a line that goes along here. So I could do that. That's what it was. That's not bad. So now you can see how this line comes up here. Now what I do is I come across here, and the distance or the time difference between this peak and this T naught is now the move out time. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to yank it up, however much that is. Yank, yank, yank. And that puts these traces like this. And now I sum up here and I get something that looks like this. Okay, so that's, that's the whole procedure. I start with all these common shot gathers. Then I reorder them into a whole bunch of midpoint gathers. And then for each reflection event that I see, I do this normal move out analysis. I adjust the trace time. And then that's going to give me a reflection. Oh, uh, yeah, it's okay. 
uh, there's two things. When you're actually doing it, you might cross, come across a word called semblance. And that's a way of kind of sort of averaging in a window here and looking to see how much uh, kind of correlated power you have. So we will often have what are called semblance diagrams, and then you find the peak of that, and then that peak is actually used to uh, determine what velocity is. So rather than looking at a particular, just a line like we did, you actually look at a little bit of, uh, of, of a width to it and then kind of work in, in windows as, as you go across here. Uh, the other thing that is important that I glossed over was something called the fold. You'll see that word. That's an important word because it tells you essentially how many times a particular point has been sampled with a, a, a source receiver pair. So if we if we look here, I've actually got one, two, three, four, five. I've got six traces, all of which reflect from the same point. So that means my fold is equal to six. And there's a formula for the fold, which is equal to the number of geophones divided by two times the number of uh, you, your move up rate. So when you when when you're sitting here with a, a source and all of these geophones, you could either move up, you know, one geophone level and do a source, uh, in which case n would be equal to one, or you could move up two, and then in which case n would be equal to. Okay, so those are two words that you'll also see. You'll see fold, you'll see semblance, and you'll hit them again. Okay, so now we've got uh, we've got virtually everything done. So we can look at our our seismic uh, our, our seismic example. So here is a uh, a common shot gather. Okay, which, uh, no, we've already gone to common midpoint gathers on this one. So, so we're going to take our, our common midpoint gather, and we're looking at these kinds of, 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 re of reflections. So sometimes there's additional processing. There might be a bad trace. You're going to get rid of that. Uh, that gives you something perhaps that looks, looks like this, and now you might be concentrating just on this particular reflection. So let's suppose we're, we're back here, just a particular reflection. So we look to see, okay, what's that hyperbola that comes up through there? And we're going to uh, then make that adjustment. And then we're going to have them up like this. So that's with the animal correction. Then we're going to stack. And we get that. And then maybe there's something else that you can do to, to sharpen it up. So this takes you from one common midpoint gather to a single trace. And now we can do that for a whole bunch of these things because we're just moving everything along. And in our case here, here is the fun. So this is like the ideal seismogram trace that, that you're working with. And then we do that for each of the common midpoint gathers. And now we actually get something that looks like this. So here's, we've got reflections from up here, and we've got reflections from down here. And here's where the geo, geologic interpretation comes in. You recognize, oh, there must be some kind of a fault that comes in here. Uh, When you come to do the uh, uh, your, your team-based learning, this is going to be one of the things that you're going to see. I'll, I showed you that before. So here's you know, some uh, co common shot gathers. And now we convert those to CMP gathers. And we're also going to do this normal move out so that you can see that, OK, these guys are all now uh, 
uniformly uh, uh, uniformly stacked up, except that what's happening in here is we're actually kind of doing that velocity analysis. We're taking those common midpoint gathers and we're kind of using a normal move out with a 24.7 uh, uh, guess 100 meters per second, it's 2470 meters per second, and then progressively uh, up to 25. And you can see what's happening here, how as you go to higher velocities, you can see how these things are kind of tilting up more and more so they're not lining. So if you did a semblance across here, you'd get lower energy. But if you uh, work up in this region in here, they're perfectly aligned. And so that would be the velocity that you'd use to stack things up. So the uh, that velocity that we were talking about is actually also sometimes called stacking velocity. So here's what's going to happen. You do, you'll take uh, a whole bunch of common shot gathers. You're going to work with them, process each one of them into uh, effectively an ideal seismogram, which is sometimes called a normal incident seismogram. You're just thinking about just the changes that are happening directly uh, beneath you and put trace by trace by trace. And when you do that, you see that, oh, I've got some very nice correlated signal here, maybe some little jumps here. You know, there's various things that are happening and it's going to be this kind of an image that you'll actually interpret. Okay, so is that whole process clear? There's a few extra words in there that uh, you haven't seen, but the, 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 the process is, is basically as follows, just to recap one, one last time. You go from these, because you're always working with a, you know, a, a sh some kind of uh, impulsive device, whether it's a vibrator or something, and a whole bunch of geophones. And so you know, you're doing this experiment here, that's, that gives you a shot gather. You go over here, another shot gather, duck, 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 duck. So you end up with this torrential amount of data. But then you start to think, okay, where is each shot and receiver? And I'm going to collect them so that they're all kind of concentrated about this midpoint. Good. So now I've collected those, and I've got that common midpoint gather. And now all I'm going to do with those is just recognize that I've got, if I have reflection events, they should follow some kind of uh, hyperbolic path. So if I find out what the velocity is for that hyperbolic path, I can determine how much move out there is for each trace. Then I just adjust it, and then I stack them up, and I get one single trace. And then that's this guy here. And then I do it again, and then I get this guy. But again, get that guy. Da, 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 da. So the amount of processing involved is actually pretty large. But at the same time, you end up with a picture that is often, you know, very uh, interpretable. Okay. Any yes. So would you have to repeat that process for each layer? Say, like, if you've got a number of different or something like that that you want to know about? Ah, good question. So let's... Uh, uh, let's see where, where did I have some common midpoint gathers? Okay, so here's, uh, here, here's a common midpoint uh, I think this is it. Looks kind of mucky, but let's suppose that this is a, a, a common midpoint gather. Okay? Then what I'm going to do is look at this. You know, I'm going to go down to this point here, T naught, and I'm going to just pick a whole bunch of trial velocities, just as I was doing in that other case, and then see what that hyperbolic curve is and kind of look at what the energy is stacking along that curve. And then I got to try a different velocity, a different velocity, and then I got to find that one that has the maximum semblance. See where? 
but what I'm what I'm doing, this is actually a better point to do. Uh, right, so here's uh, th th this is time down, down here, and now we're looking at different distances of here. Sorry, I was wrong. Anyway, so this is, this is time down here. So now we got a reflection event here, another one here, and another one here, right? And so I'm going to do this analysis that I was talking about for this guy. I'm also going to do it for, for up here. In fact, I'm actually going to do that for every time along here and then try to continually you know, do the correction and stack, do the correction and stack. And then out of that will come places here where I can see, oh, I've actually got some significant energy. So you don't have to worry about one layer at a time. You simply start with this and you do every possible time point with all of these semblance correlations and stacking, and then you end up to see what, what you've got. In the uh, uh, in the lab, and as well as the team-based learning, there's going to be a lot of kind of positive reinforcement about this. So I think by the end of the time, you'll have this stuff in in, in good hands. Uh, I've got some uh, case histories for seismic refraction and seismic reflection, but I, I'm going to way hold off on those just for a bit. So we'll have to come back to, to that. But I've got some from uh, Golder Geophysics, or, uh, and we've got some from somebody else. But I, I want to finish this up, because we only have like 15 minutes, and at least talk a little bit about uh, NASW. So we've done seismic, refraction, reflection, and now I want to talk about those surface waves that come in. So MASW stands for multi-channel analysis of surface waves. And this is why you're interested. Because you guys are interested in basically shear modulus. And if we know the shear wave velocity and the density, then we can get the shear wave modulus. We also can get Young's modulus. So if I know the S wave velocity and the P wave velocity, so we can see how we managed to get those guys, then I can get E. So I can get E and, and, and mu. So how do, we, uh, how do we go about and do this? I'm not going to go through the details, but just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of, of what goes on. And then we also have the case history. So we've got a system up here. So we've got a transmitter, and we've got a whole bunch of receivers. And we hit the set the transmitter off, and we've got all these reflection events. And now we've got one big, see, this is a, a a common source gather, so we've got a whole bunch of uh, records from diff different geophones, and this is basically what it looks like. So there's a lot of stuff coming in, but none of it's apparent to exactly you know, what is going on. What we're interested in is the surface waves that, that crop up here, and those can be analyzed in what's called a dispersion analysis, I uh, don't really want to go into it, but you'll see the plot. Anyway, the plot is frequency. So this is the frequency of the wave. Remember, let's suppose I've got a wave that, that, that looks like this. So this kind of like one period. And the frequency, you know, is one over one over the, over the period. So something that's at 50 hertz. Uh, the length of that uh, do dominant pulse is about 0.02 seconds. So what we're doing here is looking at 
So here's our here's our wave. And so let's suppose up here we get you know kind of a wave that looks like this. And then if we go, or maybe we'll make it a bit more complicated. If we go a little bit farther down, okay then we're going to get a wave that is diff it's slightly different in shape and a particular frequency. So if we look at you know, this wavelength here and we see how, how fast it's traveling, so we know the distance between these two receivers. So if this is at a distance of x1, this is at a distance x2, then delta x is equal to x2 minus x1. So we got the distance between these guys. And we can also get the uh, time. So we know the, the, we know the physical distance, and we know, we know the time. And so that means that this particular wavelet with that particular <laughs> frequency travels, you know, delta x over t. And that's actually called the dispersion velocity. Because you might have a different length of pulse here, this coda, that actually takes a shorter or longer time to, to, to travel. So the basic idea is that different frequencies travel at, at slightly different rates. And what this diagram does is try to, to kind of capture those. So we've got velocities here, and we've got frequencies. And you can see that there's sort of stuff that's coming in here that's kind of telling us that uh, you know particular this particular frequency 40 hertz maybe travels at 600 meters per second whereas 30 hertz travels at a thousand meters per second okay so we don't know how they did that but they can do it and this information is is very important because what it does is allow us to actually compute what the velocity what the shear wave velocity is as a function of depth a basic fundamental thing that's going on here is that if you have a broad period pulse like this a low frequency it turns out that that actually kind of sees deeper so this this broad period pulse kind of sense the stuff that's a, a little bit deeper, whereas this higher frequency stuff, you know, only senses stuff that's shallower. And we're actually able to unravel that to get an S wave velocity as a function of depth. From your perspective, and when you're talking to, you know, people like Golder or something like that, they will tell you the following, and this is what you'll need to know. Like, here's, here's my setup. Here's my raw seismic data. We're going to use the surface waves. We're going to do this analysis. You won't know how that is, but you know they'll show you curves that look like that. And then those curves can be taken and generated, used to generate velocity depth functions. This is what you are interested in. Because this velocity depth, that's your shear wave velocity. And now you can take this put it back into those formulas, and now you've got Young's modulus and, uh, and shear modulus, right? So this is the guy that, that you really want. So that was just a case of a couple of different pulses traveling to different uh, re receivers, and then we analyze the frequency content in that. So we got these rattle times, get our dispersion curve, get our velocity depth profile. These, these actually are from Golder. I don't know. I tried to put them into my Apple PowerPoint, but I lost the Golder symbol. So apologies to Max, but we'll catch him later. Uh, so this, this is, these are the things actually that Golder uses for doing their MASW. So they've got very small uh, d devices as far as as, as sources, everything from hammer seismic to buffalo guns to this guy here. I'm not sure that you can see that, but it's kind of a, that's, that's kind of interesting. Does that help? Can you see the, so it's just this great big thing. And this is like one huge mother ball, right? It's just big. And, uh, you know, it plops down to the ground. 
and you know vibrates everything and that's your energy source and then here's your actually you guys should know this I don't NBCC national national what is it National Building Code of Canada. Okay, so uh, this is what they use for site classifications. So they've got site classes A through E. And the thing that's interesting, so if you now you have a, a profile name for the uh, soil, hard rock, rock, dense soil, stiff soil, soft soil, the connection is in these shear wave velocities. So if you have shear wave velocity is greater than 1500, it's likely hard rock. So we go from those that MASW to experiment to shear wave velocities, and as I said, you can also get uh, Young's modulus and shear modulus. And these were just some examples. Uh, I will probably come back to these and give you some more background about what's actually going on. But this is the kind of uh, kind of idea I'm. I'm not sure where in the lower mainland this this comes from, but there was uh, uh, potential abandoned coal workings in, in here, and the goal was to you know try to find them. So here's a, here, here's a bedrock, and they're looking for something in there. And then there's a BC interior pumping region uh, here. So here's the dispersion curve that they, they would give. You can see that there's yeah, that's a signal in there. They do that. The shear wave velocity profile looks like this. So this is depth in meters, and here's what the uh, shear wave velocity is. So some of it's actually pretty low. So this is like 100 meters per second. So that is really, really kind of loose soil. There's stuff getting up to, to 600. And this was for a interior road site. So just to kind of show you. Yeah, and then just the, quickly that one that we did in, in Dublin. So now they're in Dublin, terrible thing, but there's a, this is where the uh, kind of the weight drop was right in the city of Dublin. So you can't set off an explosive. And they were, it, it's kind of essentially a roll along survey. So they had 24 streamers. Uh, 4.5 hertz uh, geophones, and then a tractor-mounted uh, weight. And then what they're going to do is to do the uh, uh, MASW analysis and try to find out what is really low shear wave velocity and, and what's high. So again, here's the seismograms. You calculate phase velocity, and that gives you shear wave velocity as a function of, of depth. And now at each, so you do that at each point, and now you've got shear wave velocity as a function of depth at each point, so you can catenate these guys, and now you got a picture. So what you're looking at here is, is shear wave velocity from 300 to 1,000. So this is really low. So this is that unconsolidated material right at the, at the surface. And this is your bedrock in, in here. And so even right in through the central city of London, you could do an experiment that gives you some information about what the thickness of that uh, rubble layer was and, and where, that, uh, where that bedrock is. So uh, yeah, that was uh, a quick run through. We'll, so what's going to happen, I'm away all next week. So as far as I'm concerned, at least we've, we've pretty much done the seismic material. I'm going to come back to this later, and we're going to work a little bit more gently through some of the uh, case histories and things. So we'll kind of do that as a bit more of a wrap-up. So you're going to have the, uh, the team-based learning on, on Friday, and then we've got next week a quiz, and then you'll have two GPR lectures given by Jeff and and then I will be back the following Monday, pick up the GPR and move on. Okay, thank you.